Tonight's final talk is from Sean Richards. And, um, Sean has been training superstar product managers in Brisbane for many years and uh, is pretty much the go-to person if you want to find some great product management training around, uh, around these parts. Um, he's also added to his product port portfolio recently and started up an F45 uh, training gym in Mount Cravat. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so he can get you fit as well as uh, helping you mm -hmm. ship your products. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Sean. Thanks, John. <laughs> If you have pens, that'll be handy. If not, maybe you could make some notes on your phone. Uh, I might just talk about how I got into product management, just to cover that off, or after how I got into it. Similar to the pen. I, uh, I fell into the role. I was offered a position because I knew some people at a company. And like Jim, I didn't really, I didn't know what it was. I had to, uh, I had to look it up. Um, that was my foray, and that was back in 91. It was a long, long time ago in Brisbane, and I was probably only... There's some similarities with what I've got to talk about here with what you've heard about tonight, which I think is, in a way is reassuring. It's good to, good to know that. I want to focus on what a product manager needs to do to be able to innovate. So organisations, depending on the maturity level, have adopted innovation as a as a core capability requirement. If we don't innovate, we're not gonna survive. Innovation you could consider is fuel for sustainable competitive advantage. And Paul talked about competitive advantage or sustainable competitive advantage. We need to be able to continually create new value in a unique way, exploiting our capabilities. And depending on the organization, innovation might happen somewhere. Um, from BrainMate's perspective, we have very strong views on where innovation belongs, and it belongs in the product management function if that function exists. As soon as it gets hived out to innovation committees and innovation hubs, side projects, it invariably drains resources, distracts the business, and sets you back a couple of years. Our perspective is there is a path in the organisation to drive innovation. It starts with who understands the problem, which is the product manager. And they have the license to garner resources, those scarce, valuable resources in the business, to solve it, and then to mobilize it, and then get it to market. There is a process, that's where it belongs. So really we need product managers to be very good at innovation. But let's just think about some of the problems that they have. More often than not, there's more ideas to deal with than hours in the day. Innovation coming from ideas. We might get ideas from salespeople. If your organization is structured that way, they've got lots of ideas. Changes from deal to deal, but nonetheless, there's ideas there. We've got ideas from customers. It's usually pretty valuable, but we'll come back to how they frame the idea. Maybe we are doing quarterly planning, doing some problem solving internally, brainstorming. They could be little ideas, they could be big ideas, they might change the direction of the business, they might open new markets, they might just fix bugs. But there's lots of ideas. And the challenge is how does a product manager sift through that and figure out how we're going to proceed with some and not proceed with others or not proceed yet. Now we're not going to go through scoring and ranking and whatever tonight, that's a totally different topic. I want to focus more on how do we start with working with ideas? Because then usually there's inherently a problem when we're presented an idea. But I'm going to get to that. To get to it, I'd like you to do a little bit of work now. So I handed out the page. Just turn it over. We're not going to worry about the worded side. I just want a blank page if you have a pen. If you don't have a pen, just maybe open up notes on your phone. I'd like you really quickly, and I'm going to be a little bit rude here because I'm giving control over to the room now. And I've got a total of 20 minutes, so very quickly this is going to get out of hand. So I might sort of do a little bit of yelling to bring it back, back to me. But I just want a couple of minutes for you guys to write two ideas. 
ideas. Maybe you've thought of something when you're coming in on the train today. Maybe you've got a business idea. Uh, maybe you've got an idea of how to solve a problem a customer told you two days ago. Just write down two ideas, really, really quick. Don't overanalyze it. Don't overwork it. Just two ideas. Go. Now, one of the lessons about ideas is you need to be ruthless. So we're just going to cross one out. How do you cross it out? Gut feel. One of those ideas you're more emotionally connected with. And emotional connection is going to help drive an idea through the organisation. There's all sorts of selection, other selection criteria. Just pick one. What I'd like you to do now, we're just going to spend a couple of minutes. You're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to share your idea. Just, just talk it out. 20 seconds, that'll do it. Then the other person shares their idea back the other way. We'll do that now, please. One of the biggest problems we have as product people, and Jen's already given an introduction, one of the core things a product manager needs to do. They need to own the problem, like a problem manager. But the greatest challenge we have is stating the problem in a way that allows a solution to actually be formed. So if we're phrasing our idea in the form of a solution, we in a way need to deconstruct it to uncover the problem. We need to find the problem that evoked the need for the solution in the first place. Because what we might find is that solution idea you have might be pretty silly really, it could be, but maybe the problem that it solves is real and it's pronounced and it needs to be fixed in some way. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to deconstruct ideas so that they are actionable. And some of this again looks similar to Jen's work. Nice work, Jen. We've got who is it for? So anytime someone comes to you with an idea, the first thing you need to know is who is it for? This thing that you've come up with, who needs it? And if the answer is everyone, you get fired. It's never everyone. There's always a segment of a market that really needs it. And you need a segment. You need something small enough to get your arms around so you can really get to know them, measure them. How many are there? What do they look like? Why do they have that problem? And then you can even get much deeper than that. Here, who's heard of the innovation adoption curve? Right, your addressable market. Start off down here with your innovators, your early adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards. And the prime area is kind of your early, late majority. That's where we all make lots of money and have holidays, right? But when we're taking something to market, maybe it is a new idea, an old company, but a new idea. You don't go and build something for that early, late majority market. You need to build it for a sub-segment of that market, which are your early adopters, your innovators. They have the appetite to move quick, to move early. They give validation so that the early majority will actually look at what you have to offer. They're not going to move until someone's crash test the thing. So there's even segment of market within there. So develop a really healthy appetite for really wanting to understand that market. And don't brush off that step. You really want to know the market very deeply. The problem, we've already talked about the problem. What is the problem being solved? And we could talk about how to phrase problem statements, so it's, there's a discipline to this. Everything should be phrased in a problem statement. We need to uncover, is it the root cause? Is it a symptom? How much impact comes from that? Are you solving the symptom? Are you solving the root cause? In general terms, I'd say most startup ideas, most development ideas, most product, new product developments fail not because the problem wasn't there, because it wasn't important enough to fix. The severity was not big enough to justify doing something about it. So Michael Scott, another well-publicised innovation space writer, he talks about inertia. If you are going to come up with a new idea and you're going to solve a problem with a solution, it's not good enough just to solve the problem. You also have to deal with the fact that people just generally don't want to change. 
there's inertia you have to overcome. You have to offer 10 times the value uh, to solve a problem, to really get them to move. But getting back to this point of understanding the problem. There's a little bit more I wanted to add. What's in it for them? That's really how do you articulate the value that they get, they being the target market. What do they get out of it by you taking the problem away? You need to know how to articulate that. And what's in it for us? Sure, uh, I think Paul said that business, I'll use my terms, business gain comes from solving customer problems. What did you say, Paul? Just business, business success comes from customer success. Customer value, term. Yeah, business value comes from customer value. Thank you. So, same sort of thing. What are we going to get out of it? There must be some sort of motivator for the business for us to go and pursue exploring this idea because it's going to burn resources. It's going to take time. Uh, it's going to take you out of action from other things. So what's in it for the business? We need to be able to articulate that as well. But if we can articulate these four things for any idea, in theory we should be able to deconstruct that idea into some building blocks of intelligence that allow us to come up with a real viable solution. And by when I say we, I mean the organisation. Uh, product managers shouldn't be forming solutions. Um, Jen touched on that. Product managers should be representing the customer and the customer's needs, the customer's problems. So that the organisation at any time, what, what's, the process, what's the problem again? Who has the problem? That's the product manager. Every time it's needed to be validated, it's there. The solution comes from your capabilities in your organisation. That's what they're paid to do. So just to wrap up, I thought maybe we could turn that page over now, just to flex the brain a little bit, because we like to a little bit experiential learning at Brainmates. We've got an idea. You've picked your favourite one. We we're ruthless about that. We've got one. We're going to stick it on the front there. Just the mad man just write it in, or if you had a post-it note, you put it there. And we're going to deconstruct who we think the market is, what is the problem that that market has that you think this idea is going to solve, and then we want to know what benefit that they would get out of solving the problem, and then what's in it for the organisation who owns the idea. We don't have a lot of time for it now, but what's really interesting is how the solution could actually be something very different to what, to, to what the idea was um, originally phrased as, just by pulling it apart a little bit. So let's spend the last few minutes just writing that stuff down, seeing what uh, comes out from that little exercise.
How are we going, everyone? We've got back on to discussions of the weekend. Um, I thought I might ask Jen to share her example. She looked like an easy target. Is that okay, Jen? Jen's going to share her example from an idea she formed and then she wrote it out on the idea pad. Um, so basically my idea, as I first shared it, um, was looking at uh, creating a platform where people can purchase services as gifts for people going through um, life events. Do you want to keep on going? Mm, this place. Yeah. Um, so who is the idea for? So people that have those that are close to them, that they're looking to support them um, in a better way and are unsure how to do that. Um, the problem that the idea solves, so it sort of combines a couple different things. Um, the problem that it solves that they're not sure how to actually help their friends, and so often they might do nothing at all, and then they feel like a really bad friend. Um, and the benefits that the customer sees by adopting the idea, so the person is able to sort of feel like they're supporting their friend better because they've actually done something about it, um, and feel that they've supported them going through a tough time. And the business receives if it's implemented the idea. This one I still wasn't quite sure about, but uh, money. They get money <laughs> <laughs> from people buying the service. Okay. Lovely. Thanks for that. And so you were mentioning before that you noticed that even someone as well trained as yourself, when you just put on the spot saying, spit out an idea, was framed in quite a solution mm. arrangement of words. Mm. It sounded like a solution. And that's how most of us think. We always want to solve problems. That's a natural trait. So when people come to you and say, I've got this great idea, um, that's normal. And so instead of going, oh, okay, how am I supposed to work with that? You can accidentally go up a lot of garden paths trying to deliver on a solution that is not elegant. It's just the solution that came out of that person's head. And customers can be like this. They want to help. They're, they're a kind of They've got buy-in. They put money into your product already, existing customers, so they want you to be successful. So if they come to you with an idea, it's pretty genuine, but they may not know how to frame it. So you really need to help them understand why they need it. And so they don't necessarily know this. So take them on the journey of saying, that's really great. Let's first just talk about that problem and who in the organisation has that. And that really helps get to the nub of what we can action. That's pretty much it. Thanks for your time.